Welcome to From His Heart with Pastor Jeff Shreve, who's in his new series today entitled, The Next Step. Do you know how to read the Bible and spend time with the Lord? How to have a meaningful, quiet time with God? Today, you'll learn the four essential truths about how to spend time with God. May 10th, 1985, was a very important day in my life. That was the first date I had with Debbie Cannon. <laughs> now, I had gotten to know Debbie just a little bit. We'd have little conversations in Sunday school. Uh, we were in the single Sunday school class at Champion Forest. But I didn't really know her very well. But I, for the very first time I saw her, I said, wow, that girl is so beautiful. And so I asked her out. I was so excited. She said yes. And I was so excited. I was getting ready for this big date. And unbeknownst to me, here I was so excited about the date. She told her roommate, I don't want to go on this date. Uh, maybe I should just stand him up. I mean, this guy is so boring. Can you believe it? She said that about me, that I was boring. And because uh, I didn't talk very much, I was very shy. And so she said, this guy is boring. We're going to have a horrible date. Uh, but I like his friend. I'm interested in his friend Stan. And so I think if I go out with Jeff, maybe I can get to know Stan better. And uh, I didn't know that when we went out, you know. <laughs> and so we went out Friday night. May 10th, 1985, and at the end of that date, she came home, talked to her roommate Donna, and said, hey, can you want to talk? And Donna was in bed, and Donna said, yeah, we can talk. And Debbie said this, first date, she said, I think that's the guy I'm going to marry. <laughs> How did that happen? one-on-one -on -one time together. That's how that happened. She went from not wanting to even go out with me to wanting to marry me in the space of about six hours. Wow. And now, sure, she knew uh, that I was good-looking, but she, <laughs> she got to know me, and she said, wow, this guy is fun. He's engaging. He, he's got a great sense of humor. I like talking to him. We just hit it off. We spent time together, and that changed everything. Hey, we're in a series called The Next Step. What is the next step for you? Today, we want to be very, very practical and talk about this subject. How can you have a meaningful, quiet time? How to spend time with God. Very, very basic, very, very practical. Here's the reality. Many people don't know how to do that. They want to do that, but they're not sure how to do that. And, you know, they look at the Bible and they say, man, this is a really big book. Uh, how, how, do I, how do I get to, to know God and, and what do I do and where do I read? And I'm not sure how to pray and it just seems so awkward to me. And so uh, how do I do it? So that's what we want to talk about today how to spend time with God, and that it be meaningful time, life-changing time. Well, as our text this morning, we want to use a guy that knew how to spend time with God. It was time that changed his whole life. That man is Moses. Exodus chapter 34, I'll begin reading in verse 29. Now, Moses has spent 40 days and 40 nights with God on Mount Sinai. He didn't eat anything. He didn't drink anything during that time. He's just spending time with God, and he is writing out the words of God on the two tablets of stone 
Because remember, God wrote them the first time. Moses broke them because when the people built a, a, a fashioned a golden calf and began to worship it, Moses came down off the mountain. He was so angry that he threw down the tablets and broke them. And God says, now we're going to do this again, Moses. So he, he spent that time with God. He was there, and he uh, carved on both sides and chiseled in the Ten Commandments that God gave him. And then it says this, verse 29, And it came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai, Uh, And the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand as he was coming down from the mountain that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him. So when Aaron, that's his brother, and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Then Moses called to them and Aaron and all the rulers in the congregation and returned with him. And Moses spoke to them, And afterward, all the sons of Israel came near, and he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil until he came out. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel what he had been, and spoke to the sons of Israel what he had been commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses that the skin of Moses' face shone, so Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him. Moses spent time with God, and the people could tell. Here's our question. How can you spend meaningful time with God, time that would truly change your life? Four essentials. Essential number one, make it the priority. This is time with God. We're going to make it the priority of our day. What is the most important thing that you and I can do in a day? Spend time with God. Spend time with God. It is so important. Make it a priority. If you don't make it the priority of your day, it'll get pushed to the back burner. And when things get pushed to the back burner and you've spent all your time at work or at school or on social media or watching TV, and in that very end of the day, uh, right before you're going to sleep, you're like, ah, oh, I didn't spend any time with God. Oh, Lord, uh, give us this day our daily bread. And the day is over and you're going to sleep and y- you missed it. You missed it. So make it. Uh, the priority of your day. Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. The things that you and I worry about and stew about and fret about and fear, the Lord says, if you'll seek me first, then I'll add all those things to you. I'll take care of all those things for you. Hey, it is a great privilege to meet with God. A great privilege to meet with God. I mean, can you imagine? God is the king of everything. He is the sovereign, the king of the universe, and he invites us to come meet with him. We're talking about meeting with God, the great eternal God. Now, when you meet with God, this is what you need to remember. You're meeting with someone who loves you. He knows everything about you, and he loves you still. David said, my God in his loving kindness will meet me. God loves you. He has loyal love for you. And in his loving kindness, he will meet you. And so I'm meeting with someone who loves me, and I'm meeting with someone who is for me. I love Psalm 56, verse 9, where David says, this I know that God is for me. This I know that God is for me for me. God's not against me. He is for me. And it says in Romans chapter 8, if God be for us, who can be against us? So I'm meeting with someone who loves me through and through, someone who wants the best for me, someone who is for me, someone who has all power and all authority. Man, what a privilege to meet with God. So make it the priority of your day. Carve out time to spend with God. Now, I encourage you to make that the first part of your day because in the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer, we call it, uh, the Lord says, he teaches us, give us this day our daily bread. You don't pray for daily bread at the end of the day. You pray for daily bread at the beginning of the day. And so it's best to meet with God first thing. You give him the first part of your day. And not only do you make it a priority, but you 
prepare the place. You have a special place. Moses had a special place that he would go to meet with God. It says in Exodus 33, Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, a good distance from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. And it came about that everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. You need to have a special place that you go to meet with God. Now, that might be on your back porch. Or it might be in your backyard. It might be in your bedroom. It might be in an office in the house. It might be in the den. Debbie and I go to the den, and that's where we have uh, our quiet time where we seek the Lord. Hey, it might be you are a stay-at-home mom with little kids, and you, your life is just so hectic. Your special place might be the bathroom. Because that's the only place that the kids leave you alone, at least for a few minutes before they're knocking on the door. Hey, Mom, uh, come get me, help me, do whatever. But maybe it's there. Maybe it's your car. And that, that's your special place to just be alone with God. Wherever it is, make it a special place. Make it a priority. It is important you're spending time with God. So that's the first essential. Make it the priority. Because if you don't see it as important, if you don't see it as the priority of the day, it gets pushed back until it doesn't happen. Second essential, understand the purpose. Understand the purpose. Why are you doing this? Why are you having this time with God? What is the purpose? Look what it says about Moses. Exodus 33, verse 13, he's talking to God, and he says, Now, therefore, I pray you, if I have found favor in your sight, let me know your ways that I may know you. That I may know you. What's the purpose of meeting with God? So that we would get things from God, so that we could pray and bring our laundry list of things that we need, our grocery list, well, God, I need this, and I need this, and I need that. Is that, is that what the purpose is? No. The purpose is that you would know him, to know God. Now, when Moses said, Lord, I want to know you, the word for know in Hebrew is the word yada, Y-A-D-A, -A, yada. And it's the same word that's used to say, and Adam had relations with his wife Eve, and she gave birth to a son. It's to know intimately and personally. And he said, God, I want to know you in an intimate, personal, deep way. And that's the purpose of a quiet time. We meet with God to get to know him better. The passion of the Apostle Paul's heart, he gives it to us in Philippians chapter 3. He said, more than that, I count all things to be lost loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. What was the driving passion in Paul's life? To know him. Now, did Paul not know Jesus? You say, what, did, did he not ever uh, have an encounter with Jesus? Yes, of course. That's how he got saved on the road uh, to uh, Damascus. He had an encounter with the risen Christ. He came to know Jesus in a saving way that day. But now he wanted to grow in his knowledge of God, in his experience with God, in his depth of relationship with the Lord. And that drove him. That was the passion of his life. That's the purpose of a quiet time, is to get to know God better. And why is that so important? Because as you get to know God better, you love him more. And that's the greatest commandment of all. When Jesus was asked, what is the great commandment? He said, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. So we meet with God to know him better. We meet with God so that we can love him more and grow in our love for him. Now, you mark this down. To spend time with God is to know God. And to know God is to love God. 
Now, I can't really love God until I know God, and I can't really know God until I spend time with God. So Debbie didn't really know me when we went out on May the 10th, 1985. She, she just thought, well, you know, he's, he's kind of quiet. He, he's, he, she had some uh, preconceived ideas about me being boring. I tell you what, I'm not boring. I'm a lot of fun if you give me a chance. But here she is. She had this idea, and then she spent time with me, and then she walked away saying, I can't wait to marry him and serve him, and that's a good thing, right? <laughs> I, I, I want to be with him. I want to marry him. That was uh, all that changed by spending time with me. Your life will change. Your love for God will grow as you spend time with him, as you get to know him. So understand the purpose. Why are we meeting with the Lord? Why is this such a priority? Because as I meet with God, I get to know him better. As I get to know him better, I love him more, and that is the greatest commandment of all. I love what Rick Warren says. He says when he gets up in the morning, he, he sits in his bed, and he just says, God, if I don't do anything else today, I want to end this day saying, I know you a little better, and I love you a little more. And at the end of the day, if I can say, God, I know you a little better, and I love you a little more, it was a good day. It was a good day. I don't care what else happens. It was a good day because I fulfilled the greatest commandment. So understand the purpose. Essential number three, bring the particulars. Bring the particulars. You say, what is that? Particulars. Well, the, the articles that you need to spend time with God. Moses was going up to spend time with God. Exodus chapter 34 in the beginning, and Moses met God on the mountain, and God told him, you bring two tablets, and you're going to write down the things I tell you. And so he had to bring two tablets, and he had to bring a, a chisel and a hammer. He had to bring the things that he needed to meet with God. What do we bring when we have a, a time with God? We bring this book. We bring our Bible. We bring a pen. We bring paper to write things down or a journal. Maybe you bring a devotional. You definitely bring an open heart to the Lord. You know, the, the goal, really, when you think about it, us before the Lord, uh, the Lord says that he is the potter, we're the clay. The only thing that the clay can do, the only thing that you and I can really do is to be soft clay in the hands of the master. We don't want to be hard clay. We don't want to be stubborn clay. We want to be soft clay. So I come before the Lord. I bring my Bible. I bring a pen. I bring some paper. I, I maybe have a devotional book, and I bring an open heart. I bring a soft heart. I bring a heart that says, speak, Lord. Your servant is listening. I want to hear from you, and I want to do what you say. So you bring the particulars to your time with God. Now, Moses was going before the Lord. He'd come into the tent of meeting to speak with God. That's what it says, to speak with God. But then he would come out, and he would speak to the people what God had spoken to him. Time with God is not a monologue. It's a dialogue. We talk to him. That, that's called prayer. He talks to us. That's called reading the Bible. That's how God speaks primarily is through his word. So we meet with God, or when we meet with God, we talk to him. We talk to him in prayer. And Moses was doing that. He would talk to God out of his heart. He would share things with God. He would ask God things. That's good. That's right. That's important to voice your request to God. Now, some people don't really know how to do that. Prayer is something that's easy on one hand, it's hard on the other hand, and people have difficulty with prayer. Let me give you a little acrostic for prayer. I think Chris gave you this uh, toward the end of last year in December when he preached, but it's worth repeating. It's the acrostic ACTS, A-C-T-S. What do I do when I pray? A. A stands for adoration. I come before the Lord, and I praise Him, and I adore Him, and I uh, extol God for his goodness and his grace and his faithfulness and his word and the way he's working in my life. So I, I adore God. C, I confess my sins 
to God. That's really important. That's important to do that up at the top of coming before the Lord. You confess your sins to God. Why is that so important? Because Psalm 66, verse 18 says this, If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. If I have sin, known sin in my heart that I'm holding on to, that I say, well, this, you know, this lust is there. This, this sexual immorality is there. I'm living with my boyfriend or my girlfriend. I'm sleeping with my boyfriend or my girlfriend. I have this sin here, and I'm not willing to deal with it. Hey, if you regard iniquity in your heart, God's not going to hear you. If you're bitter toward a friend, a neighbor, a family member, whoever it might be, and you know you're bitter, and you're holding on to that bitterness. God says, well, you can pray all day long. I'm not going to hear your prayer. You need to get rid of that sin. If I regard wickedness and iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. So I come before the Lord in confession. I pray Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thought, and see if there be any hurtful way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to to cut yourself up in little pieces and, you know, inspect every little thing and you're just picking yourself apart. Well, maybe I said something I shouldn't have said. Oh, I need to confess that. Maybe I did this and that wasn't right. Maybe, oh, I forgot to smile at that person at the grocery store. And you, you just beat yourself up. Don't do that. Don't do that. It's not morbid introspection. It's God, here's my heart, here's my life. If there's some sin there, show me. Show me so that I can confess it so that I can get it out of the shadows and under your blood. Adoration, confession, T is thanksgiving. I thank God. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, and everything gives thanks for this is God's will in Christ Jesus concerning you. And I thank God for the difficulties I'm facing. I thank him for uh, the way he's answered my prayer. I thank him for this. I thank him for that. I thank him for my health. I thank him for all the things that he's done for me. And then S is supplication. That's when you make your request known to God. That's when you say, Lord, I need help here and here and here and here. You pray for other people and you pray for yourself. So prayer is involved. And it's not just prayer and then Bible study. When you're reading the Bible, you pray as you read. And so it's not all just, well, I prayed, now I'm going to read. Those things interact because it's a conversation. It's not uh, just a monologue. Well, it's my time to monologue, now it's God's time to monologue. No, we go back and forth. But when we meet with God, we talk to Him. And then secondly, when we meet with God, we hear from Him. So I'm meeting with the Lord to hear from the Lord. Speak, Lord, as Samuel said, your servant is listening. Jesus says over and over in the book of the Revelation during the, with the seven letters to the seven churches, Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, he would give a message to the church and he'd end the message by saying this, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear. So we need to have an ear to hear. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. You know, sometimes in some churches, the pastor can get up and speak and the people aren't listening. <laughs> that's not in this church. That's in another church. But sometimes you can be playing duck, duck, goose over here, and you say, well, you're up there, or you're down in here, and you say, well, you know, the pastor doesn't see me. Can you see me? If you can see me, I can see you, right? That goes both ways. And so, so we want to listen he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So it's not just I show up and I check a box. It's I show up and I really listen. I want to hear from God. And God speaks primarily through His Word. His Word, as we said last week, is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow. And it's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We grow, long for the pure milk of the word, that by it you may grow with respect to salvation. God speaks to us through his word. God is speaking to Moses, and he speaks to Moses, and he has Moses record what he speaks, and Moses writes the first five books of the Old Testament called the Book of Moses, the Pentateuch, the five books. That's all Moses, inspired by God, sharing with the people. 
So Moses is spending a lot of time talking to God and listening to God and writing down what God tells him to tell the people. Hey, it's important to spend time in the book. Now, this question comes into play. I don't know how to do that, Jeff. I had a friend ask me just the other day. He said, I need to start reading the Bible. I don't know how to read the Bible. Should I start in Genesis? I mean, that makes sense, right? You, you get a book. Where should I start? I guess I'll start in Genesis. And Genesis goes okay until you hit chapter 4, and then you hit a bunch of names that you can't pronounce. And God forbid if you have a King James Bible, you hit all these begats. You don't even use that word begat. And so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so begat so-and-so. It's like, what does that mean, they begat so-and-so? You know, I mean, it doesn't even make sense to you because we don't use that terminology. And so it's really, really difficult. I tell people this. Hey, when you start reading the Bible, don't start in Genesis. Although I love the book of Genesis. Start in the book of John. Start in the book of John. John's 21 chapters. I said... Read the book of John, one chapter a day. 21 days it'll take you to read the book of John. And when you're done reading the book of John, start reading the book of John. Start over in chapter 1 and read it through a second time. And then when you read it through a second time, read it through a third time. Spend three uh, months, roughly, two and a half months, reading the book of John, just a chapter a day. Now listen, we talk about reading the Bible through in a year, and that is great. My wonderful wife has done that for uh, 20, how many years? 32 years. Every year reading the Bible through. I did that with her last year. I'd never done it before in terms of trying to do it in a whole year. That's not a good plan for me because I'm not good at reading for distance. I'm better at reading for depth. And here's the thing. A quiet time is different from study time. Because a quiet time is just you want to spend devotional time with God. Now, some people are able to do it, read the Bible through, and that's really, that really speaks to them and really ministers to them, and that is great. I'm better at reading the Bible through if that's study time, not necessarily quiet devotional time. So I'd rather read 10 verses and it really speak to my heart and it rattles around in my mind and heart all day long than to read 10 chapters and I can't really recall what I read because it was so much. And so, what's the purpose of Bible study? I like what one man said. He said, some people read the Bible legalistically. I, I do it because I have to. I do it because it's a check-the-box thing, and I'm a check-the-box person. And so I get up in the morning, and I spend time with God, and I say, check, I did that. And they read the Bible legalistically. Some people read the Bible superstitiously. Well, I do it because if I don't do it, God's going to get me. And so, you know, what's, who knows what's going to happen. I didn't have my quiet time today. God's going to give me the Hong Kong colic. I'm going to get coronavirus. Who knows? Something bad's going to happen to me because I didn't have time with God. They read it superstitiously. Some people read it educationally to know facts and figures just in case I get on jeopardy. I'm ready to go. You know, it's just educational. Other people read it professionally. I mean, I'm, I, I've done that before. Lord, I need a sermon. I need a lesson. I'm teaching a class, and I come to the Word of God, and what am I coming for? I'm coming professionally so I can pull out of there something to teach. Some people read the Bible proudly so they can answer every question in Sunday school. Look how much I know. They read the Bible proudly. How are we to read the Bible in a quiet time with God? You're to read it lovingly, devotedly. Lord, I just want to hear from you. I just want to express my love to you. And I want to receive your love for me. I'm not trying to get anything from you. I just want to spend time with you. You know, we all come to God, and God wants us to do this. We come to God, and we need things from God. Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing, but with me, you can do all things. And so we come before the Lord. He tells us to do that. Come boldly before his throne of grace, Hebrews 4, that he may, you may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so we come before the Lord with our needs. But here's the thing. Some people seek God just for his presence. 
P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S, for his gifts, for what he can do. They don't seek his face, they seek his hand. God, what can you do for me? Help me, God, I need help here, I need help there, I need help uh, in some other way, but I need something from you. We are to come to God not for his presence, his gifts. We're to come to God to marinate in his presence, just to be with God. My mom is 91 years old, and uh, I talk to her every Sunday, and that's just kind of our thing. I call her on my way to church, and then we try and see her as, as much as we can get to Houston. And my mom is just a wonderful lady. And, uh, you know, in my life, I've had uh, lots of opportunities to talk to my mom, to spend time with my mom. Sometimes I would ask my mom, hey, I need your help with this or that. My mom was a Latin teacher and an English teacher. And so doing papers in high school and college and seminary, hey, can you read this? Can you help me with this? How is this worded? What's grammatically correct? She would help me with that stuff. And so I'd come to her, and it would be maybe not a lot of chit-chat. It was just, hey, Mom, I need your help here. And that's okay because our relationship is built on love. It's built not on the gifts she gives me. It's built on the, the relationship we have, the, the being in her presence and, and loving her for who she is, not for what she can do. Hey, we come before the Lord. Oftentimes we come and we have needs, and God, I need help here, and I need help there, and I need help uh, somewhere else. And the Lord says that's fine as long as our relationship is built on love. It's built on love. And as long as you do seek my face and not my hand. See, if you seek God's face and not his hand, you know what? You get his face and his hand. If all you do is seek God's face, what he can do for you, God says, well, you don't really love me. And so I'm really not interested in doing for you because you're using me. Has anybody in this room ever been used? Nobody likes being used. And if we sense that, that someone is using us, we back off. God doesn't want to be used, and he's not going to be used, but he helps those who seek him and who love him. And then lastly, essential number four, display the proof. Display the proof. You've spent time with God. Display the proof. You say, what do you mean? Moses, after he spent time with God, everyone knew. Why? Because the skin of his face would shine. He was in the presence of God, and the glory of God was so strong that he got some afterglow on him. And the people saw Moses, and they would back up. Man, his face is shining. And Moses recognized, hey, people are afraid of me because as I spend time with God, my face begins to shine. And so he put a veil over his face so he wouldn't scare the people. But they knew. There was, there was the proof that he had spent time with God. There was the glory of God on his face. Now, has that ever happened for anybody else where their face shines? I mean, did, did David have that? Did Daniel have that? Did Elijah? Elisha? No, just Moses. Just Moses. But all of us who know the Lord and love the Lord and walk with the Lord, we can experience the glory of God on our lives. We can display the proof. The apostles did that. Peter and James, or Peter and John did that when they were arrested by the Sanhedrin for preaching Jesus, and they stood up uh, in the Sanhedrin and they boldly proclaimed Christ. The scripture says, Acts 4:13, when they observed the confidence of these men and understood that they were uneducated and untrained men, they recognized them as having been with Jesus. Ah, we know you guys. You were with Jesus. They sounded like Jesus. The way they presented things with such boldness and such confidence, that was like Jesus. They didn't see their face shine, but they could tell that they had been in the presence of the Lord. Now, if we really have time with God, people can start to tell. Why? Because our lives are different. We, we, it, things change. Now, remember this. I said to spend time with God is to know God, and to know God is to love God, 
And the way you know that you love God is you obey God. You do what he says. Jesus said, John chapter 14, verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. He'll know me even more. He'll know me even deeper. If you really love God, you'll obey God. And the Lord says, if you don't obey me, guess what? You don't really love me. You don't really love me. So you say, well, Jeff, I'm spending time with God, but I hear what he says, but I don't do what he says. Well, James says you're a forgetful hearer. You're not an effectual doer. You're not going to be blessed in what you do because it's the doers of the word who are blessed in what they do. And you're not going to shine for Christ. You're not going to make a difference in this world. You say you spend time with him, but you don't really spend time with him because you're not doing what he says. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? If you really love me, you'll obey me. And if you don't obey me, you're just showing me that you don't really love me. Hey, the Pharisees spent a lot of time reading the Old Testament, reading the law of Moses. They would memorize the first five books of the Old Testament. You try and memorize Leviticus. It's a difficult task. It's hard to read some of Leviticus. It's just all these laws and all these rules, and it's just like, praise God, we don't have to live under that anymore. We're under a new covenant. But they would memorize the whole thing, and they missed what it was all about. And they were lovers of money, the Bible says. They weren't lovers of God. You can know the Word of God and not know the God of the Word. What's the goal of Bible study? What's the goal of spending time with God? To know Him and to obey Him. And a meaningful, quiet time makes you more like Jesus. That's the goal, that I'd know you, that I'd be the person that you want me to be, Lord, that you'd use me in this world for your glory, for your kingdom, that I would shine and share, shine for Christ and share what great things the Lord has done. Now, Paul picks up the imagery of Moses and the veil in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and he says this, We all, with unveiled face, Beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That's the Christian life. We grow. He must increase, I must decrease, as John the Baptist said, and we go from glory to glory. We grow in our relationship with Him. Now, we know from watching our kids that they they grow up. They come in as a newborn, and you feed them, and you love them, and you take care of them, and they go from a newborn to a toddler. They go from a toddler to a grammar school kid. They go from grammar school to being an adolescent, to being a teenager, to being a young adult, to being a fully mature uh, person. And we see that taking place. Now, the same is true in spiritual growth. Here's the thing. You don't see it day to day. You don't have a quiet time today, and tomorrow you say, well, I'm, I'm like super Christian. It doesn't work like that. You don't notice change in people day to day. You notice change in people month to month, year to year. And that's what happens in the Christian life. We were talking at Man Up this Thursday about miracles. Marcus was talking about uh, experiencing a miracle. And so we were talking around the table when Marcus was done. We always have table talk at Man Up. And so we were talking about what's, the, what's the, one of the greatest miracles you've ever experienced. And so I told the guys, I said, you know, the greatest miracle I've ever experienced was the transformation that came when I gave my life to Christ and began to grow in him. I had a guy tell me. I got saved when I was 17. I had a guy tell me, this was a few years ago, one of the guys I went to high school with, and he knew what I was like before I got saved. And he said, Shreve, he said, you were the meanest guy in our school. I said, I was not. He said, you were. You were the meanest guy in our school. I said, I was not. He said, you were. I said, well, you stink. You know, I, I got on to No, I didn't really do that. But he said that to me, and I thought, that's not true. Now, I wasn't the guy that w w went around beating everybody up, but I was cutting. 
And I like to get involved in, in cutting people down. And I would say things about people. And, and uh, so he, I said a lot of things about Jackie. And so that's why he said, you are one of the meanest guys in school. But I thought about that and I thought, what a praise that the Lord would take a guy that some thought was the meanest guy in school and save that guy and change that guy from the inside out and make that guy a preacher and a pastor and a witness for Christ and use him around the world. What a praise that God would do that. That's the greatest miracle of my whole life. And the same thing that happened to me can happen to you. As you receive Christ, as you walk in him, as you spend time with him, as you let his word richly dwell within you, as you begin to memorize it and meditate on it, and five minutes a day turns into 10 minutes a day, turns into 20 minutes a day, turns into 30 minutes, an hour a day, that you just spend time with God, hearing him and walking with him and obeying him. He'll change your life. So start today. Start today. When I was in college, I made a vow to God that I would spend five minutes a day with him, that I wouldn't go to sleep without spending five minutes a day with him, reading his word and praying. It seems like a small thing, doesn't it? Five minutes. I mean, who can do five minutes? But here's the thing. Many of you, not trying to call anybody out, but many who come to church call themselves Christians. They don't spend five minutes a day with God. So if you'll do that five minutes a day, it may be five minutes more than you're spending now. And God will bless us. My friend, maybe you're watching today and you're not sure about your relationship with Jesus. Hey, the next step for you is to open your heart and receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Just pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But I believe that you are God in the flesh I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, I ask you to forgive me of my sins, come into my life, into my heart, change me and make me the person you want me to be. I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as your Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you, and He has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more about that plan. Go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real